Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to what's going to be for most of you, I'm sure, a truly interesting, uh, informative and entertaining uh, day or two. Now the reason I say most of you is because obviously many of you in this room over the weekend will allegedly be hypnotised. Um, <laughs> Now, uh, for those of our hypnotised, it will be a very relaxing, enjoyable, if somewhat slightly unusual experience. And for those who are hypnotised, although you'll even say the word sleep rather a lot over the next two days, none of you will actually ever be asleep, or at least I hope you're not. Um, it could, if you're hypnotised, you'll just be fully aware of everything that's going on around you at all times. It's just you'll have this overwhelming desire to almost everything and anything I say. <coughs> which, for those who've seen the DVDs, yes, now's the time to worry and leave. <laughs> Seriously, though, the reason I say almost everything and anything I say is because it is impossible, allegedly, to make anyone say or do anything that would totally contradict the morals or the values. So what I'm going to be looking for over the weekend are some volunteers to come up here to the front to help me demonstrate things who've got no morals and got no values, and then I'm sure we can have a great time, and that's probably going to be the crew that were in the bar last night. <laughs> All those that join us tonight. Um, if you don't smoke, don't worry. We can start you by the end of the weekend. Uh, if you're not alcoholic, we can also sort that out. You will be by Sunday night. This is what you call a reverse self-help seminar. Um, your life was wonderful when you arrived. You go home a complete fuck up, but don't worry about it. And somewhere along the way, you will actually learn how to help people that much better with what we do. Um, it helps me to know where you're all coming from, and by that I don't mean Denmark, America, India. I mean where you're coming from in your mind. Um, it's not a case of it's group therapy, don't worry, we're not going to go around doing that, unless you want to. Uh, but more of a point of how many people in this room have actually seen any of my DVDs before? Cool. So, over half. How many people have been at a seminar before? Blimey. Okay. For those that don't know, the other half, uh, if you're easily offended, now's the time to fuck off. <laughs> because believe me, it doesn't get any fucking better. If you are easily offended, this weekend will challenge your belief system. But there again, if you did not challenge your belief system, then this weekend will be a fucking waste of time. Some of the things I teach you, demonstrate, or tell you this weekend, you will sit there, or sit here if you volunteered, and you will think to yourself, what the bloody hell is it going on about? Some of the things I show you, as impressive as they will be at the time, you'll think, how the hell could I ever use that in serious therapy, if that is what you want to do? By Sunday afternoon, if not before, generally by the end of today, it's normally day one, people start to uh, see the point, it will all make that a little bit more sense. Now, this is your final chance, albeit that they started half an hour ago. If you'd sooner go on a nine-day course and learn an OP, nonsensically long pantomime, as I like to call it, then please go to the other function room over there and pay your grand and a half and go in and get bored fucking stupid for nine days. <laughs> If you want to learn what works in the real world, then stay around, you're in the right place. What I'm going to need to start off with, though, is this is called There's No Such Thing As Hypnosis. Make of that what you will, that will make a lot of sense by the end of the weekend. But I'm going to look for volunteers in a minute, but before I do, I need each and every one of you in this room to do exactly what I say, within reason. Uh, so what I'd like you to do, put down your handbags, your purses, anything else you've got in your hands. And if the women can do the same, that would be a great start. Tremendous. Some people, yeah, move around, tell people what's funny, that's good. Okay. And then what I'd like you to do is put your hands out in front of you like that, okay? Each and every one of you, hands out in front of you, outstretched in front of you, keep your hands there. Unless I say otherwise, unless I see otherwise, keep your arms outstretched in front of you. Because in a few moments' time, I'm going to count from one to ten. On the count of ten, I'll give you some very simple instructions to follow and if you follow them and use your powers and this is the key your powers of intelligence imagination 
and concentration. And for each and every one of you that uses those powers of intelligence, imagination and concentration effectively, then something very strange, somewhat unusual, but very enlightening indeed will occur for you because you'll find that by the time we get to the count of ten that what I suggest to you becomes real. So on one, as your hands are like that, now just place them so your palms are facing each other. And just interlock your fingers so the fingers of the left hand are against the back of the right hand. The fingers of the right hand against the back of the left hand. Press your palms tightly together, thumbs down on top. Squeeze your hands together just as tightly as you can, each and every one of you. Squeeze your hands together as tightly as you can, and I mean really squeeze them together. Use your powers of intelligence, imagination, and concentration effectively. Take a nice deep breath in through your nose. And then out through your mouth, that's wonderful. It just oxygenates the bloodstream, it helps us relax on one, just close your eyes. It makes it that much easier to concentrate on your hands. Keep squeezing your hands together tighter and stiffer with every breath that you take. Every noise that you hear, every word that I say. Some of you will find that with each count, as we get closer to ten, that your hands may begin to shake slightly. If they do, don't worry, it's perfectly natural, it happens all the time. You won't go blind and your hands won't drop off. But that's another story. You tell me the man because I was a room from like him. Seriously, well, nice deep breath in through your nose. And then out through your mouth. On two. Imagine now using your powers of intelligence, imagination, and concentration. Imagining that every nerve, fibre, tissue, and muscle in your body, especially from the tips of your fingers to your wrist, from your wrist to your elbows, from your elbows to your shoulders, is starting to lock, glue, weld, cement in place. Use those powers of your mind effectively. See it as 100% total reality. Some people are good at visualising. Others have to think of the word. Whatever is right for you, do it now on the count of three. You should take another nice, lovely, relaxing breath in. And then out. Every nerve, fibre, tissue and muscle getting tighter and stiffer. Almost as if the muscles from your wrists to your elbows to your shoulders are locked, glued. Welded, cemented in place, if you use your powers of intelligence, imagination, and concentration effectively, as I'm sure you will, then you'll find that now, with every breath you take, every noise you hear, every word I say, that every nerve, fibre, tissue, muscle on four is getting tighter and stiffer. It's almost as if that perspiration, that sweat that now starts to form on the palms of your hands, is turning into the world's strongest superglue. Stick in the palms of your hands, stuck, fast, tight, locked, glued, welded, cemented in place. If you use your powers of intelligence, imagination and concentration effectively is on five with every breath that you take. Every noise that you hear, every word that I say, every nerve, fibre, tissue and muscle now locking, gluing, welding, cementing in place. Six. Tighter and stiffer. It's almost as if somebody's got a steel bolt and they put that steel bolt through the back of your hands. And now they're doing the nut up on that bolt tighter and tighter and tighter with every breath that you take, every thought that you think, every word that I say, every noise, sound, idea that you hear. That nut's being done up on the count of seven. Tighter and tighter. Locking, gluing, welding, cementing in place. Every nerve, fibre, tissue and muscle in your hands, locked, glued, welded, cemented in place, on it. Another nice deep breath in. Then out. It's almost as if somebody's poured concrete now over the back of your hands, encasing your hands in a block of concrete. If you show your powers of intelligence, imagination and concentration effectively, then your hands will be encased in that block of concrete right now, getting tighter and stiffer. Tighter and stiffer with every breath that you take, Every noise that you hear, every word that I say on nine, each and every one of you, keep believing in the world's strongest superglue, sticking the palms of your hands, stuck fast, tight together. Keep believing in that steel bolt through the back of your hands, where the nut's being done up tighter with every second that passes by. Keep believing your hands are stuck in a block of concrete, and for you it will be very real indeed. And what I'd like each and every one of you to do right now is just put your hands up above your head, up above your head. That is wonderful, each and every one of you up above your head. Just a sign and a signal, a sign and a signal to allow your hands to get tighter and stiffer. It's a sign and a signal for you to allow your hands to get tighter and stiffer with every breath that you take, every noise that you hear, every word that I say, that is fantastic. Using your powers of intelligence, imagination and concentration effectively on ten. On the count of ten, each and every one of you, you can stay where you are. However, as you do, 
Just open your eyes, but keep believing in everything I've said and stare directly at me. Look into my eyes, or around the eyes, into the eyes. Seriously, look. Keep believing in the world's strongest superglue. Keep using your powers of mind effectively, and as you do, for some of you this will be easy, for others it will be difficult, for many of you it will be impossible. But if you believe in what I've said, use your powers of mind, then just try and separate your hands. For many of you, you'll find the more you try, the more they stick. Just try. Some it's easy, for some it's difficult. The more you try, the tighter they get, getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Don't try and force them apart, because you'll fucking hurt yourself. But just try, that's wonderful. Good. That's what I like to see, about half the room find it very difficult, half find it reasonably easy. The moment I clap my hands, those that find it difficult at the moment, you'll just be able to separate them. One, two, three, separate now. <laughs> that just proves that Duracell outlast all of the batteries. <laughs> you see, for some people it's easy, for some it's hard. Anyway, enough of uh, sexual problems. Um, <laughs> Seriously, look. For those of you who've seen the stage hypnotist work before, okay, the majority. Oh. This, that's the bit they don't show you on TV. However, it is essentially what they call a suggestibility test, or rather, weeding out the people who are gullible, um, which will become more evident as the day goes on. I will be asking for volunteers as the day goes on to come out to the front. Please be aware that when you come up and volunteer, whatever I say is not a personal attack on you as a male or female. Whatever race, gender you are, it doesn't fucking matter to me. I take the piss out of everyone. So, please don't take it personally, okay? It is very important, that. But, we are all gullible. Each and every one of you in this room are so fucking stupid, you've shown up here this weekend to listen to me waffle on. So, you're all gullible. And I'm gullible enough for showing up. Um, but what do I mean by that? Well, some of you found that difficult. Some of you were actually, <clears throat> couldn't get them apart. For others it was, so what? Who gives a shit? Quite frankly, so fucking what? Some of you found it difficult. So what? Some people with arthritis would find it difficult. It doesn't make you a fucking hypnotist. What is hypnosis? And that's what this weekend's about. Because stage hypnotists use tests like that, and in fact in some therapy books, I'm sure, you know, some of you have, I won't say wasted the time reading such books, but, you know, I've read books and they cover these things and call them suggestibility exercises or, or you know, death tests or whichever fancy name they decided to call. And allegedly that tells you how responsive that person's going to be. Right. If that was the case, what I'm about to do wouldn't work. Because allegedly, according to the books, I should only pick on the person whose hands they found it impossible. So let's have a show of hands of the people who found it remarkably easy to separate the hands. Cool. About half of well, the other half. So who'd like to volunteer for this then? You, sir? Give the gentleman a round of applause. Let's see the one in the room. Thank you, sir. I didn't say you could sit down, but you can for now. <laughs> you don't mind if I call you sir, do you? After all, it's only in fun. No, seriously. What I'd like you to do, just stand up, sir. Seriously, nice one. Just put your feet together like that. Put your right arm out in front of you. Make a fist. Please don't hit me yet, but just make a fist. Put your thumb up in the air. Stare directly at your thumb. Now, according to the textbook, I shouldn't be doing this on the show. I should be using somebody whose hands were... <laughs> Fuck the textbooks, because they're wrong, trust me. That's the point of this weekend. On the count of three, and only on the count of three, I'm going to ask you, keeping your feet together if you are so kind, that's wonderful, to rotate from the waist, keeping your feet together, and move your thumb and follow it with your eyes like that, in a clockwise direction. And the very moment you feel any pain or discomfort in any way, and it's not about showing off in front of the crowd, it's about stopping before you break your hip and try and sue me. Um, and then I'd just like you to stop. Okay, so on the count of three, following your thumb with your eyes, one, two, three, moving at the waist. Whenever you feel that you want to stop, stop. Okay, just look past it, remember what you see. Um, to me, it looks kind of like that door area. Yeah, remember what you see now and just follow your thumb back with your eyes. That's wonderful. 
And if you'd be so kind, just close your eyes down and imagine doing the same thing again. Imagine moving your thumb, following it with your eyes, and seeing the audience. Then the screens over there, the speaker, the flip chart stand, the door. But this is just a dream in your mind. You can make of it what you want. So I'd like you to imagine, if you'd be so kind, going further than you did before. So you go past that door and something you once thought may have been difficult proves itself to be so ridiculously easy. And you can change your life right now and feel so good in yourself for making those changes instantly here and now, right this second. And when and only when in your mind's eye, you can, it's almost as if you can feel that in every nerve and cell in your body, even though it is just imaginary. But when in your mind's eye you've gone further than you did before, then and only then, just open your eyes. Whenever feels right for you. Okay, in that case, open your eyes, look at your thumb, keep your feet together as you did before. On the count of three. One, two, three, follow your thumb with your eyes. Do the same thing, but you're going further and further and further and further. That's your new reality, ladies and gentlemen. You can see how much further that was. You will take that with you. You can achieve whatever you want to achieve. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> According to the textbooks, I shouldn't have picked on you. I should have gone for somebody who's hands locked together. Because then my job would have been easier. Apparently. Um, if you follow the so-called textbooks, then, yeah, you become brainwashed. And you would believe that. So you would automatically set yourself up to think that, mm -hmm. oh dear, didn't lock his hands together, so it's not going to work. And if you think that, then the chances are it won't. Because 99% of what we do as hypnotists, NLPers, life coaches, whatever winky wanky title or name you want to give it, is bullshit. What do I mean by bullshit? Well, 99% of it is down to having the confidence to look like you know what you're doing. So fuck the textbooks. Because if you become programmed by that which people teach you, and that's the irony of it, everything I tell you this weekend is bullshit. Don't believe a word of it. It's fucking useless to you. You're going to learn fuck all this weekend, unless you want to. It's what you make of it, what you take away, what you do with it, how you adapt it to yourself, and the way you use that to either help yourself or other people or a combination thereof that really matters. But if you allow yourself to be pre-programmed and believe the textbooks, then it says, you know, um, unless you've got this depth of trance, don't attempt to do such and such a treatment. Unless you've got this depth of trance, don't attempt to do... So in other words, don't try out the person unless you've got this textbook case reaction. We are not... It's a slight paradox, this, but on the one hand, we're not, as human beings, textbook cases. We are, however, you need to read a lot of bloody textbooks to cover all the textbook cases. So it's about being adaptable, being flexible. And some of what we cover up till about 12 o'clock when we have the first brew break, we don't have lunch till 1.30, but some of what we cover till 12, for a lot of you, may seem, especially those who've seen my DVDs or read the crap, may seem like, bloody hell, here it goes again. But it is very important that we cover the basics before we look at that that we, we need to do. And that's not to decry any training that any of you have done. I'm not saying that my way is the right way. I'm just saying that, for me, it is. Um, you'll all take different things from this experience this weekend, some of which you'll use, some you won't, it's up to you. But the one thing, if you're building a house and you follow a textbook, if that textbook is fundamentally flawed, then there's more chance of you putting the wrong foundations down and there being problems with the house quicker. If you put the right foundations down, you may never have to spend another penny on that house. So sometimes the obvious things are the things we need to look at. And 
Some of you in the room want to be stage hypnotist, some of you want to be therapist, some of you already do those things, just want to make more money or be more effective at what you already do. So some of what I tell you this weekend, you'll go, Ooh, stage hypnosis, don't want to know about that. Trust me, you do. Because therapy wouldn't exist if it wasn't for stage hypnotists. Again, it comes down to whether you believe the textbooks. But if you actually search historical documents rather than hypnotherapy textbooks written by, oh yes, we're very serious clinical people, so we've got to put across this professional reputation type textbook where they give you their version of the truth. If you go, and these days on the internet, it's very easy to find this information. If you get the documented, provable fact, Frank Anton Mesmer was not a fucking mesmerist to help people. Yes, he did that. But originally, he was a street performer, doing magic tricks like the cups and balls on the street, and also trancing people out, whatever fancy name he gave it. It was a street performer. He was a stage hypnotist. It just then people attributed him with some kind of mystical, magical skill. Uh, an example of that in this day and age would be I suppose the most recent one would be the likes of Darren Brown in England, or in America, David Blaine. People seem, although they know it's all trickery, people still fall into that trap of going, oh, it's got a special power, can you help me? And they get all these requests to help them with the problems. Which is a bit of a big clue in itself as to what state of mind most of your clients are in when they come for help. But we'll return to that. So he quickly realised there was money to be made in helping people. Um, so we started doing these magnetised rods and all this, but if you, we're not going to cover history, so I'm not going to spout on about it for ages, but check it out. The guy was a street performer, for Christ's sake. He was not a so-called therapist. Um, but if you read the so-called serious stereotypical textbooks, they like to present this, we have nothing to do with stage hypnosis story. Without stage hypnotists, therapy wouldn't fucking exist. And the irony of it is, without the stage performance full stop, the conventional medical professional, forget hypnosis, wouldn't be as advanced as it is now. Because many years ago, fucking surgeons advanced what they did and they got their funding through selling tickets at exorbitant prices to rich people to come and watch them doing experimental operations. It became a form of entertainment, almost. Oh, sorry, I suppose they'd call it medical research. But, you know, there was an audience, they paid for a ticket. They got some kind of perverse enjoyment from it. In my world, that's entertainment. So even in the serious medical world, the president is that without nutters, con men, um, mavericks, call them what you will, things would not have advanced. So if you go back to the root cause, in therapy they say go back to the root cause of the problem, treat it, the symptoms disappear. Well if you want to do something right, go back to the root. If these people whether they're misrepresented in a serious textbook or you go back and find out the truth. Either way, what they say about them is pretty damned impressive. You know, things haven't really moved on a great lot. In fact, in many ways, they've moved backwards. Because, let's be honest, how many therapists do you hear of this, these days who are curing thousands of people every fucking day? Like allegedly Mesmer was with his metal rods. So, you know, it could be argued things have moved backwards. So, don't always believe what you read, but by the same token, don't believe a word of what I say. Especially because I'm going to tell you now, a hypnotist is nothing more than a con man. There was a magician in the magic world, conjuring, Paul Daniels type magician, David Copperfield type. Uh, speaking of Paul Daniels, I can do a tricky car. I've got hair, just about. <laughs> Although, according to Debbie, he's got a big magic wand, but that's another story. Now, a hypnotist is also an actor. Whether it's on stage or in therapy, we're also actors. Now, David D. De... Yeah, David Devant, 18th century magician, 
who was like the Houdini of his time, said a magician is merely an actor playing the part of what the audience perceive a magician to be. So I'll paraphrase that because it's very true. A hypnotist, whether a stage hypnotist, a therapist, a life coach, an helper, whatever fucking title you want to give yourself, a hypnotist is merely an actor or actress, sorry girls, I'm not being sexist, you can all beat me up at the break, um, but an actor, a hypnotist is an actor merely playing the part of what the client or audience or company, if it's corporate, but say client, what the client perceives you should be. Or at least that's what a good hypnotist is. Because if you just follow the stereotypical textbooks, you would do the same things in the same way all the time. Because that's the way a lot of training tries to brainwash and program you. And I'm not saying that wouldn't be effective if you're really focused on it working, then the intent within yourself, honest intent to help people in itself, is therapeutic and helpful. However, if you can be adaptable and fit to people's preconceived ideas, and we're brought up in this world to, oh, don't be sexist, don't be racist, don't be ageist, which is all well and good, but like it a fucking lumpy, we all do it. We see somebody, we make a preconceived idea. We, met, we might be proved wrong later. When we get to know the person, we might be proved right. But we do, like it a lumpy, make preconceived ideas. As do our clients. If we do something, the chances are lots of other people do. We're not suddenly something special because we know a few techniques that most people don't. So, preconceived idea, well, rather than wasting time telling people that, no, 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 I'm a serious hypnotherapist, no, it's nothing like stage hypnosis, you, you know, no, 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 you won't be running around like a chicken in the consulting room, you fucking waste ten minutes putting the mind at rest, because you've been programmed by your textbooks to think that you've got to get rapport with the client, which, yes, is important, but that you've got to put the mind at rest, and that could scare them. Bollocks. My experience is that when people come out with comments like, oh, you're not going to have me run around like a chicken or something, are you? What they're actually asking, albeit in a somewhat coded way, is, are you capable of doing that? Because I've seen a stage hypnotist on telly, or I've heard about it. Have you got the power to be able to do that? That's what the saying deciphered. Now, if you start telling them, no, it's totally different, we can't do that, what you're essentially saying to them is, I'm not quite as good at being able to help you with your problem as you hoped I'd be. So you're setting yourself up for failure, or certainly less of success to start with. My preferred reaction would be something like, well, do you want to run around like a chicken? To which, obviously, the well, nine times out of ten, they go, no. <laughs> if they say yes, well, you know, they're paying you. Give them what they want. <laughs> but nine times out of ten, they'll say, no, why? You go, well, you paid for an hour of my time, and I thought you were here to achieve X, Y, Z. Now, if you want to run around like a chicken, we can do it, but that's going to waste 40 minutes of the hour and our time together short today. You, do you want to leave here? future pacing, do you want to leave here with that problem gone? Well, yeah. You've overcome the issue in their mind. Because you've put the emphasis now on it, it'll cost them more money to run around like a chicken. <laughs> but what you've also put into the head is that you're capable of doing that, and yet you've never had to prove to them that you could. And in their mind, as twisted and as perverse as it is, whether they consciously be aware of it or not is another matter, but to think that you could do those things and control them says to them that you can help them. So you will actually make your job easier by taking those preconceived ideas that people have, those misconceptions, and using them to your advantage against them to help them. And at the end of the day, if you've got somebody there for therapy and they're paying you Whatever, that's a totally different seminar, as people will tell you in the brain. That's the marketing one. Um, but the pain you whatever, 
and they've said they're paying you to stop smoking. If they stop smoking, does it matter how you achieve it? As long as they stop, they got what they paid for, then have you really ripped anyone off? Yes, you will hear me say a lot this weekend, we're con people, the best way of conning them. That's my technical term, shall we say. It just gives me a buzz to think I'm shafting somebody well and royally. But in actual fact, you know, shafting them well, handsome. But again, enough of my sex life. Uh, no, seriously, look, if they get what they pay for, then you've done what they wanted. So you're not ripping anybody off. So surely, if we are going to add ethics to this, and let's pretend for a minute I've got ethics, but if you're going to add ethics to things, then surely ethically we should do everything we can within our capabilities as a human being to provide our clients or audiences or whatever with that which they are paid for. Some of the ways we go about achieving that might be slightly unconventional, especially after this weekend. But at the end of the day, if you truly want to be ethical and moralistic about things, then surely the most important thing is, well, depends how you look at it, I said the most important thing is getting the fucking money off them. But, that aside, the most important thing is providing them with what they want. And although I said that in jest, getting the money off them is very important. Um, let's just quickly find out how many people in the room are either therapists or wanting to be. Okay. How many people in the room do the stage side or want to at some point? Few? Okay, cool. How many people in the room will narrow therapy down from one to one? So, one to one client, shall we say, firstly. Okay. Group sessions, corporate work. Right, okay, we've got a fair. Well, there's somebody for everything here, so that's cool. Um, because what the fuck is therapy? It's nothing more than a con game. Psychiatrist, conventional psychiatrist. And a lot of this is so blatantly obvious. But it will make so much sense by the first brew break, I promise you. Conventional psychiatrist, you go and eventually after so many sessions as a female or a male. Yeah, I won't be sexist. I'll pretend it's me. It's easier to have the path than that. So I've gone along to this therapist, psychiatrist. And he goes, you're stressed out. Yeah, well, there's got to be an underlying reason to this. And we're, we're going to have to probe you till we find out what that is. So for week after week, they be asking me questions about my childhood and anything bad that I come out with. The next week, bring you out again. You remember that time when you were young and you fucking got beat up and all this? And then one week, hopefully, he hopes, according to his textbook, I'm going to blow it out. Uncle Bertie shagged me up the arse <laughs> when I was five. And that's why I don't like birthday cake anymore, because my face went into it as he was, you know? <laughs> It sounds bizarre, some of the examples I give, but if you actually relate it to textbooks you've read, you'll see the irony of it is. This is fucking true. Um, so now, I suddenly know Uncle Bertie shagged me up the arse, and if he's an enterprising therapist, he'll have photographic evidence to show me or something like that. Um, but he, he, now he starts to work on convincing me of how painful this was. You know, I'm, all, I'm, all right, I'm already fucking emotionally fucked up more than when I started out. But now he's going to tell me how bad it was. Because apparently working through that and coming to the realisation of it later in life helps you resolve that that went on. Yeah, but it is possible to eliminate emotional connections of pain of the past and restructure behaviour and stuff, which we'll cover over the weekend without having to re-examine the fact that Uncle Bertie shafted you over the birthday cake. You can do it without really having to... So, you know, these people are actually psychologically raping their clients again and again over sessions. How fucking ethical is that? 
in my world, if somebody has got a problem and there is a way to help them, generally in one session, sometimes longer, but generally in one, that causes them the least amount of pain and discomfort during that treatment, and ultimately it gives them the life change that they want, and that's the key. The life change that they want. Not the fucking change you think they should have, because you're the high and mighty therapist who's read the textbook and you've got to deal with it this way. Some people don't want to fucking know Uncle Bertie shagged them over the birthday cake. For some other people, they prefer to know that truth. But all of us are different, as are our clients. And surely, if ethics come into it, it's our responsibility to do what our client, them as an individual, a human being, with their own thoughts, emotions, desires, beliefs, environmental background, that that is right for them. And that seems so stunningly fucking obvious, as many of the things I'll say before 12 o'clock will. As the day goes on, it becomes less obvious, as I start dragging you out and throwing some of you on the floor, in a nice way, you understand. Um, but it seems so obvious, and yet a lot of us forget these obvious things. And it's the obvious things. Yeah, we'll cover techniques later today and tomorrow. Yeah, I'll teach you quick ways of hypnotising people. Yeah. Whatever hypnosis allegedly is. Yeah, I'll show you ways of taking somebody's emotional pain away in two minutes flat. But at the end of the day, it'll all come back to these level 101, obvious, so fucking obvious, that's why they work, facts of life. And it's because they're obvious that your clients don't think, when they're coming to a perceived professional with a fancy title, that all you're actually going to do on them is something that, quite frankly, as long as they've probably got the intelligence to order a pint when they go out in the evening, they could probably sort out for themselves if they have the desire and motivation to do so. Quite often, people are actually just looking for an excuse. Or a, you could say a final kick up the arse, but it's generally an excuse. So that they can remove the blame from themselves, because people who are ready for change, and, you know, all your clients will say, yes, I'm ready. <coughs> That's not fucking necessarily the case. They might be getting coerced by a member of the family, probably all encountered it, so they haven't real they're doing it to make somebody else happy. When they're doing it for themselves, truly for themselves, then they're ready for change. But at that point, in fairness, they could do it for themselves just by making that decision to make that change. And it really is as simple as that. However, what goes on psychologically is this, for a lot of people. At the point they realise they're ready for change, they then start to get a guilt complex that they've allowed themselves to have this problem for so long. So rather than have to A, decide it's time for the change, and B, face up to the fact that they could have sorted this out a lot sooner if they'd wanted to, by going to a therapist, they can offload that responsibility to somebody else, because then it's like, I couldn't do this on my own, I needed somebody to help me do it. So it's not their fault anymore. So we give people the ultimate excuse. Just the same as the stage hypnotist gives people the ultimate excuse, the volunteers. That's why they will, well at my shows anyway, get the tits out, play with themselves and do all the disgusting things. Because at the end of it, they can go back to the audience and say to their friends, he hypnotised me, he made me do it. Or, oh, I don't remember doing that, did I? I didn't, did I? Oh, oh, oh. They know fucking full well what they're doing. <laughs> but they've got their ultimate excuse. They can put the finger of blame elsewhere. And just as they say in sales, and it's the same with stage hypnosis, therapy, life, full stop, the fingers of blame, when you point them, look how many are pointing at yourself. 
And that applies to life in general. So we're born. Some eventful day our mother and father are. Our mothers or our fathers. You know? Gay relationships. Once there were two queers. Now there's fucking loads of them. How did that happen? I don't know. But you know, it might have been artificial insemination. I don't know. But it's, at some point, somebody got impregnated with it. Or a test tube did. In which case, you're born under the sign of Pyrex. But... <laughs> But you arrived here, into this world, at zero years of age. Or if you're Chinese, at one year of age, because apparently the moment you're born, they say you're a year old then, but that's another story. But you're born. We are all born the same. Within reason, that is. Um, yeah. We are all born essentially the same. Females have certain body parts. Now, if anyone wants a demonstration in my hotel room tonight, Please come and see me later. You get the idea. It's what happens to us from when we're born. Although some people would argue also what happens while you're in the... beside your mother or the test tube, affects you. We'll leave that debatable one. We'll say from when you're born. Now, you read a lot in psychology, it says from zero to seven years of age are your formative years. These are the times, according to the textbooks, when you're most likely, and what a reassuring thought for all zero to seven year, seven year olds, that's the time you're most likely to have Uncle Bertie shaft you over the birthday cake. Because apparently when you get past seven, it very rarely happens if you believe the textbooks. It's generally before then. But think about that. Well, seriously, look. What goes on in our life, whether it's at school, at home, if we have abusive parents, or we have loving parents, you know, having parents that spoil you. Whatever happens, it has a knock-on effect to our development as human beings. That is why we all become, to some extent, the dif different, but the same. Because at the end of the day, we all piss and shit the same way. Unless you've got a colostomy bag. Slight change on it. But within reason, we're all pretty much the same. We all have to put a certain amount of fuel into our body, food, to stay alive. Take in liquids. From time to time, we get ill or, or, or don't feel on top form, depending on what frame of mind you're in. There's basic things that affect us all. We all have to have somewhere to live. Whether that's a cardboard box or a big mansion, it's neither here nor there. We still all tend to say we live somewhere. Even a homeless person says they live on the streets. It's a matter of identity and circumstance and environment. And depending on your environment when you were young will affect, to a greater or lesser extent, what you do long term in your life. Um, and I'll take a wild guess. The person that was shagged over the birthday cake, Uncle Bertie, probably didn't become a baker. <coughs> but no, there is a serious message in there, and at a subconscious level it will become clear later. But what happens to us when we are young affects what we do. What happens this morning, before the 12 o'clock break, will make a dramatic difference to what you make of what goes on this afternoon. At the minute, some of you will be thinking, what the fuck's he on about? But this afternoon, and for those who've been here before, please tell the newbies that it does start to make sense after lunch. Because um, you were going to leave at lunchtime last time, weren't you, Dale? Weren't you? Like, well, it crossed your mind. Well, you were just pulling me like that. But, you know, the basics have to be in place. And people, you've got a choice. And this is the interesting thing. Yes, I've studied psychology. And yes, I could go on for the next two days just about psychology and how it helps us as therapists. But I'm not going to do it because I'll tell you for why. Because the psychology I use in the real world when I'm helping people is probably that much out of all I fucking read on psychology. The most important bit is that to remember that human beings are all essentially the same. It doesn't matter how much money somebody's got, what they look like, whether they're male or female, what race they are, gender or religious belief. 
Okay, sometimes religious belief or the brainwashing that people have can affect what they are prepared to talk to you about or do. But when you get past that, which using some of the techniques will demonstrate and teach this weekend, you will be able to very easily. When you get past that, at the end of the day, we're all essentially the same. All of us have some type of fears and insecurities. Unless we're a psychopath. You know, we, we all have some sort of fears and insecurities. We all have times at some point where we don't feel on top of the world. It has to be that way because otherwise how can we ever say we know what happiness is? Or that we've ever laughed? Because to be able to feel pain, you have to have something to compare it to. Something that was pleasurable. To be able to laugh, you have to know what isn't funny. Albeit that's subjective, it's down to you, the individual, the environmental background you've been brought up in. That. But you've got to have something to compare it to, so that you know that that's pleasurable rather than painful, or that's funny rather than sad, or yes, I shall hit that person, or no, I won't because he's a policeman. We build up things through our life, and we relate to them, but we do it in a split second. We store everything in our laptop computer. And everything that happens to us, when we, as a kid, we burn ourselves on the fire, most times that develops into, don't go near the fire, it burns you. For some people it turns into a strange sexual fetish and they make a lot of money with specialist websites. But, you know, that is up to them. But we all tend to, generally speaking, learn certain lessons in certain obvious ways. And that's the key message there. That which is obvious we often overlook. Because, especially with therapy, when people are doing courses and teaching people, they tend to want to overcomplicate a subject to justify why the course takes nine days, or whatever, when you can actually learn it in next to no time. Then as therapists, we like to sometimes fall into the trap of well, mm, yes, we need to approach this in such and such a manner because the training said to, I must do it that way, otherwise it won't work. To justify to ourselves why we spent all that money on training, why we took the time to learn it. Must, must have been for a reason. I mean, we don't want to admit to ourselves that we pissed a load of fucking money up the wall. This is what we do in life. We justify things to ourselves, but with that, we just instantly focus on things, because otherwise you're causing yourself pain by thinking, I wasted that money. And that's what your clients do as well. Quite often a lot of problems are nothing more than people trying to avoid admitting to themselves that they've done X, Y, Z wrong. I'm not saying they, you know, enticed Uncle Bertie to shove him on the Bertie cake, you understand? But quite often, albeit that is very controversial, quite often Women are going to fucking kill me at the brain, but if you send me DVDs, you know I don't wrap it up. A lot of rape victims were fucking asking for it. But no, they weren't, come and fucking rape me. But if they look back on it, that's why they end up feeling guilty. They look back on it, there were lots of things they could have done differently that would have seriously, dramatically decreased the chances of that happening. Obvious things, just like the police saying, you know, if you've got valuables in your car, don't leave them on shore on the chair. Because you're more likely to have the window smashed in the neck. It's the obvious things that do make the difference. Right, NLP. Nonsensically long pantomime. Natural language patterns. Neuro-linguistic programming. Um, nonsense for fucking lanky pillocks. I don't know. Call it what you will. It's just another title for in my terms, conning people and getting a result. But they say in NLP that modelling, their technical term, deciphered, copying, um, what other people do successfully is the key to them becoming successful yourself at that. And the honest answer is that, yeah, I, well certainly in my world, in my own head, and that's all that matters to me, I'm successful at what I do. I know I get results. 
But that didn't magically just land in my head. I modelled, copied people when I was younger. And that's the only thing about NLP that, quite frankly, to me, fucking makes any sense, although we will cover NLP uh, probably this afternoon and do a master practitioner course that normally takes a week in about 20 minutes. Um, but yeah, if somebody's doing something, I mean, fucking hell, you don't need to spend a grand and a half to work that one out. If somebody's doing something that works over here, and somebody over here is doing something that is not working, and they carry on doing it that way over here and it works, and this person over here carries on doing it the way they were doing but keep failing, which one are you more likely to want to emulate? I'm going to guess this one. It's not fucking rocket science. It's stating the fucking obvious. But that's the irony of it. The obvious things are what work. And the irony of it is that there's nothing that we do as therapists, there's nothing that medical doctors do, quite frankly, that's any different than any human being on this planet is naturally, instinctively, led to do if we were all to live in, shall we say, a natural environment. These days we'd probably call it a controlled environment, like a prison. And interestingly, in a female prison, most of the inmates, once they've been there for a couple of months, they fall into line with the other female inmates, they're following the same routine, eating the same food, same lighting conditions, same environment, and they all end up coming on and having the monthly cycle at the same time, same day on, same day off. Why? Because they're all in the same environment. Now we class it as freedom these days that we can go to bed at the time we want to. We can turn the lights off when we so decide in our own home. We call that freedom. We, we, we focused our minds on the idea that that's good. And I suppose in this day and age it is because, you know, the way things are, we have bills to pay, kids to look after and what have you. But if you do something, whatever it is, unnaturally, that is not normal, and sooner or later you will get a result, a reaction, or a symptom that is not normal, that is unnatural. If you do things that are natural, you are far more likely to get a natural or normal response. If you only get two hours sleep a night, at some point you're going to end up fucking worn out and knackered and tired. And you could become dangerous to yourself. If you eat too much of the wrong food, you'll get fat if you don't do exercise. I'm stating the obvious, but yes I am. At the end of the day, you know, it's the obvious things that matter, especially with so-called hypnosis. And what the fuck is hypnosis? Some people say it's that moment where the ego and the id meet and relax. And the moment the ego is just getting in line with the id and they communicate together, everything goes straight. Fuck off. <laughs> Perhaps it is. Who gives a fuck? Does it matter, as long as it works? Other people say it's a, it's a very dreamlike state, and it's very relaxing, but you'll be fully aware of everything that's going on around you at all times. Fine. Other people say, oh, well, you may find that um, you can't remember what we say, but it'll still work. And the irony of it is, dependent on what they've said to the person in front of them, more often than not, for the majority of the people they've said it to, that will become that client, or audiences, or whatever, reality, for the majority. There's always going to be an exception. But the majority of the time, if you say you won't remember things, the majority of them won't. If you say you'll be able to remember everything, the majority will. So there's a big fucking clue there. All we're doing is literally telling people what to do. They're giving over control. And like it a lump it, hypnosis is control. And hypnotherapy is control. Fuck what the textbooks say about hypnotherapy. It's about empowering people. Fuck off. It's about taking money off them and taking control of them for a limited time period to give them the kick up the arse they need or the excuse that you've 
without you they couldn't have done it. Or in some cases, rarely, it can just be giving them some nugget of wisdom or product of your own experience that they weren't aware of. You know, hypnosis might not even be required. Although the pain for that, so you give it them. But it might just be that certain sentence you say to them that they haven't thought of that can change their life. So, you know, well, it makes me laugh, but therapy. Seven steps to therapy. What is a therapy session? <coughs> well, it's whatever you want it to be, obviously. This is just kind of a, a simplified model uh, that I like to use, for example. And I break it down into seven steps. Step one, gain rapport and introductory talk. Rapport, right. There's nothing better in my world for getting rapport than the moment I've took the fucking money off them. That tends to make me dead receptive to them. I've realised, just a, perhaps it's just me, but I, I tend to find that I feel I want to help them more then, you know? <laughs> and the, the, they tend to pick up on that and feel, you know, see, that is actually, there is a truth in that law. By taking the money off them up front, they make a personal commitment financially. Now, money is not everything to everyone. But, like it a lump it, if you're going to charge people 250 quid, let's say, for a session, or more, hopefully, some of you, um, it's generally enough that they do think twice before they hand the money over. So, by handing it over, they are kind of saying to their own subconscious mind that this is going to work. Because let's be honest, people don't, as a rule, sit there and go, I'm going to hand this money over and it's not going to fucking work. I'm an idiot. I'm just... They don't. By handing it over, they're sending a massive message to the mind that this will work. Otherwise, that, that's why they're paying the money. So get the money off them up front. But rapport, yeah, in other words, be, be a good actor. Make it look like you actually care about them. Perhaps if you do, so much the better. But if not, acting helps at that point. Oh, or if that's unethical for you, then you have to go, actually, I don't like you. Go, go. I don't want money. I won't help you. Uh, I'd, I'd suggest acting works quite well. As long as they feel that you're doing what they perceive to be what should happen, then it's fine. Introductory talk. Right. <clears throat> Introductory talk. The importance of that. Hmm. Lots of conventional books tell you this, this, that, the other. My experience is this. You need to know what the name is, okay? And it's wonderful, because in my book, there's a 16-point questionnaire, and if you get them to answer those 16 questions, not only does it conveniently save you having to remember what to ask them, because they're in black and white, but also it kills the first five minutes. Looks like you're taking due care and attention to find out about them, so you're a caring, sharing therapist. And it gives you the information you need, which is, what's their name? Well, as Dale Carnegie wrote How to Win Friends and Influence People, quite correctly said, and many psychologists since have, a person's name is to them the sweetest word in the English, or American, or Indian language. Because we, we get used to it, we're sort of responding to our name. I mean, it might be slightly different if it's a case of, Fuck it out, you... And you know... But, as long as it's said in a normal manner, it's generally the nicest thing people can hear is their own name. So rather than just going through the session, and as you relax in that chair and feel every nerve, fibre, tissue, muscle relaxing, and never mentioning the name, if you can put in, and as you lie there, Sue, just notice now that your right legs, and you throw in the name regularly. It makes it seem all that more personal. You're paying more attention to them. You must obviously care about them. And you're setting up a psychological framework where... Oh, bless. Aren't they a nice therapist? They must be good at what they do. And as long as the person thinks you're good at what you do, therefore your chances of success are much greater than somebody who's sat there thinking, mm, will it work or won't it? It's not rocket science. You need to know how old they are. Um, and they normally say, don't ask a woman their age, so you can divert them. Ask them how much they weigh instead. No. <laughs> no, no, no. What, what I tend to do is, because it's a feedback form, is ask them to fill in the date of birth. And then it's a quick mental exercise 
uh, to work out how old they are. Because once you know the date of birth, you know how old they are, but then one of the other things you will ask them is, what is that they consciously remember the most painful, um, emotionally disturbing thing that's ever happened to them? Now this may or may not have relevance to what problem they've come with. But whether it's directly relevant or not, we can use this to our advantage. You will also ask them what they're consciously aware of is the most pleasurable, positive, happy, feel-good experience of their life. Again, this may or may not be relevant directly to what they come to you with, but it doesn't matter because we will use this to our advantage. Because rather than using a textbook script, oh, we've got these stuttering clients in here, yes, that's for stuttering, we've got them under there. This is what we say, and it's, as you were, could you put a speak in a way they understand this? You were, you know, rather than using the same script for everybody, yeah? You make it so completely individual to them. I know, it, it doesn't it feel bad to realise that you can laugh at sick jokes and enjoy it? And notice how good that feels inside. <laughs> Unless you bent over the vertigo. But anyway, <laughs> serious look. Sick, indeed. But funny. Um, so you've got pleasure, you've got pain, which are two motivating factors we'll come back to in a minute. Everything we do in life, good, bad or indifferent, is motivated by either pain, pleasure or a combination thereof. But how much better than using a textbook script that's the same for everyone? How much better to when we'd normally be referring to some imagined painful experience to be able to mention one that they've genuinely experienced and gone through and is personal and private to them? And the same with a pleasurable one. How much better because a person's name or personal experiences are to them far more powerful than using a fucking textbook script? And it's great as well, because then you don't have to, like, you know, get your glasses out and start reading the script, or if you can't find... Because your script is made up by the person in front of you. They are your script. They give you the answers. They know the answers to their problem. They just don't know. They know the answers yet. And the irony of it is, with this initial questionnaire, they're going to give you the answers that all you're really going to do is feed back to them in a different way and charge them for the pleasure of doing that, and they will actually be then coming to this realisation down to your help. Very exchanges, no robbery. So we find out the name, their age, the pleasurable experience, what age they were, the painful experience, what age they were, because then in our minds, knowing their date of birth, they might say they were like 10 in this painful thing, but using the date of birth, we can work out what year 10 was. So when it comes to that point in the script, we can go, just imagine now in your mind, you're back in 1983 when that thing happened. And when people are relaxed and the mind's distracted, which obviously is the so-called hypnosis we'll be covering, they'll suddenly go, 1983? I never mentioned it was 1983. By that point, they forget they told you the date of birth and the age. It's like you've almost got some psychic power to... You know, playing with people's preconceived ideas, and it makes everything all that more effective. We ask them the so-called obvious, and it is obvious question, but again, it's the obvious things we often forget. What do you want to achieve as an outcome from today's session? <coughs> now, that might be obvious if they rung up and said they want to stop smoking. But there's many ways that could be answered. And I'm only using smoking as an example. They might go, well, I want to leave here and never smoke again. Other people might go, well, it'd be really nice if I've stopped by the time I go to see my mum again in two weeks' time. Whatever they say, however daft, strange, twisted, bizarre, is what is right for them. They are giving you all the clues, all the signposts, all the fucking information right in front of your face. But if you follow stereotypical textbook scripts, you would conventionally ignore what they're saying, use what they say against them, and saying against them sounds like we're trying to get one over on them. We are, but in an ethical, nice way. We're trying to get, but do what they want. Don't try and fucking sit there judgmentally and go, well, actually, we, if we do it a different way, we'll stop smoking completely today. Oh, if, if they're happy, 
cutting down over the next fortnight, and then definitely stopping. Do it that way for them. Because they've already got an idea in their head that that's going to be right for them, otherwise they wouldn't be saying it. So why waste time, well first, well it depends how you look at it, but why waste time trying to convince them otherwise? And at the end of the day, something that happens in the mind that is imagined, and something that is genuine, when the imagination and the will are in conflict, and in different situations, this works at different levels for different people, but with the hand-locking bullshit at the beginning, some of you did find it impossible, some found it difficult, some found it easy. But at the end of the day, all you've done is wrap your mind around a psychological idea. And then you try to separate your hands. Well, the word try in itself implies that you won't be able to do it. Could try, deciphered, means that, well, you can't. That's why you've got to try and do it, because otherwise you instantly do it. So then your will comes into play and you go, well, I'll try and separate my hands. But as long as you've got your mind wrapped around that imaginary idea enough, that is a stronger force than reality. So that which is imagined is more powerful than that which is real. And that's generally the cause of all phobias. It's not the fucking spider that makes you scared of the flying. It's the fear of being scared. There is only one phobia, the fear of being scared of something. Whatever that event or trigger may be. 